There's a short 10 minute film which I had intended to show right at the end. So what I think I will do is to start with that film. It's, it's a short documentary on one of our initiatives um, made by the film is made with local communities. The film is made by a very um, talented woman. Her name is Gail Podrabiski. She's a friend of Snow Leopards and she's a um, board member of the International Snow Leopard Trust. This film was uh, shot in Ladakh. So let me just um, put it on and it should be for about 10 minutes. That should also give time to people, anyone else too. The Indian Himalayas, 4,000 meters above sea level. Here, winds carry more than smoke and dust. Mantras of compassion and goodwill are blown across these mountains. People have managed to eke out a living in the stone wilderness with what little the land provides. For the villagers of Gya, livestock is precious, providing many of the basic necessities they need to survive. The hardship of life in these mountains is etched across Tashi's face. Like so many in his village, Tashi has been herding goats all of his life, surviving on less than two dollars a day. And these goats are his lifeline. Their wool is his sole source of income. Losing just a few animals could be devastating. Every evening, the goats are secured in a pen, Tashi's small shelter, within earshot of his precious animals. and for good reason. They share this unforgiving landscape with a stealthy hunter. Highly camouflaged and highly elusive, snow leopards are seldom seen. Much of their lives are shrouded in mystery. Snow leopards are a really hard species to study. They're so perfectly camouflaged. They occur in really harsh and difficult terrain, extremes of climate, and they are rare. Researchers can't say exactly how many snow leopards remain in the wild, but many believe there are as few as 4,000 animals scattered across the mountains of 12 countries. The very real possibility of snow leopard extinction looms. Loss of habitat from mining and other human activity has placed increased pressure on the cat and disrupted a delicate balance. For generations, snow leopards and people have shared these rugged mountains. But over the last decades, this fragile relationship has been put to the test. A growing population of domestic animals combined with a warming climate has led to increased desertification, turning fragile grasslands into dust. In the precious grazing land that remains, domestic herds are squeezing out wild sheep and goats with the snow leopard's prey in decline, the cat turns its sights to easier game, 
like Tashi's prized goats. When domestic animals are killed by a cat, it's a serious financial setback for the entire community, and the response is swift. Experts estimate that up to one snow leopard is killed every day, and nearly half of these deaths are a result of retaliatory killing. It's the single greatest threat facing the snow leopard. And it's hard to talk to a person about conservation if they're living below poverty line. And the first step in that situation is to enable that person to have a, a steady livelihood, send his or her kids to school. And if you can help them do that, they will help you with conservation. There was a time when Tashi would have hunted down and killed any cat that threatened his livestock, but not anymore. Today, he has other options. But developing these options didn't come overnight. It took many discussions and sharing of ideas. Before Tashi's village, the Snow Leopard Trust, and Nature Conservation Foundation, arrived at ways they can protect their livestock. In 2013, the community and the Snow Leopard Trust established a livestock insurance program managed by the village. As part of this unique program, both the Snow Leopard Trust and villagers like Tashi pay into a fund that gives herders compensation if they lose an animal to a snow leopard attack. Now the community has some security against financial loss, and in return, they've agreed not to retaliate against the cats. Tashi feels the support of his village, and through the program has learned even better herding practices. Implementing a conservation program in a village has two dimensions. The first is the viability of the project. But more important is the acceptability of a project. So it's, it's really about understanding and trust um, between the communities and us here. Yeah. Recognizing the decline in prey, the villagers also set aside a plot of land exclusively for wild sheep and goats, free from grazing livestock. Over the past five years, the land has made a remarkable recovery. The numbers of blue sheep are on the rise. Numerous plant species have also made a comeback. This reserve has already increased the biodiversity of key mountain species and revitalized the land. The community and the snow leopard are both benefiting from this partnership in conservation. The Snow Leopard Trust works in partnership with communities across the snow leopard's range, including China, Mongolia, Kyrgyzstan, India, and Pakistan. These programs, forged by community members, aim to create sustainable conservation projects to ensure the snow leopard, its prey, and the communities who share their home continue to thrive. Projects like the Livestock Insurance Program are unfolding across the mountains of Central Asia and clearly demonstrate that sustainable, community-based conservation is working.
Okay, I hope you got a sense of the landscape and the kind of um, land uses in this landscape. This is what happens across most of the high mountains of South and Central Asia. So what I have done today is, what I'm going to do today is to share some of my experiences in both uh, research and conservation over the last 20 years. And uh, well, I will sort of keep alternating between local to the global, from between research and conservation, and uh, basically keep going back and forth also between, let's say, my own personal learnings and anecdotes and, uh, and our scientific findings, the things I have learned over time and the things I thought I had learned but I had to unlearn. So a little bit more about the, um, the hero for the evening. As you saw in the film, it's an endangered species occurring in 12 countries, high mountains of 12 countries of South and Central Asia. In case you've ever wondered why it is called a snow leopard in the first place. It's largely solitary, although we find evidence that sometimes individuals can actually move together. This is rare footage of snow leopards during the mating season. Mating seasons typically in late winter and then they give birth in uh, summer. It's a lot of territoriality and social marking. So this is a snow leopard leaving a scrape on the ground. It's a form of social signaling. It's quite a fascinating species, very rare to uh, see in the wild. And this footage actually is shared with us by the, our friends and partners in the government of Nepal. So I'd just like to acknowledge um, their contribution. So my, I have had a long association with Nepal, but my own sort of research and conservation journey, the main journey started in the mountains west of Nepal in a place called Spiti Valley that some of you might be familiar with. It's a high altitude landscape in the state of Himachal Pradesh, um, inhabited largely by Buddhist agro-pastoral peoples who um, keep some livestock and also raise one crop every year. The growing season is very short. It's high mountains, it's cold. So the growing season is very short, so they can just do one crop each year. And I went to this area and specifically to a village called Kibber some 23 years ago. And as a PhD student, I was a young researcher and I had gone here to sort of, this was my study site for my research. But over time, Kibber, the community of Kibber, as well as many other communities in Spiti Valley, and this entire valley itself became much more than a study area. And this is where we also ended up doing, initiating a lot of so-called conservation experiments, trying out initiatives with local communities, and some of the initiatives, and we still have very, very strong partnerships and work going on in this landscape. And some of the initiatives that have worked well in this landscape, like the livestock insurance program that you saw in the film, that has subsequently been expanded to other, other parts of the country, like Ladakh, as well as other countries, including China, um, Pakistan, and Mongolia. So now I had gone there as a young PhD researcher, like I said, and um, I had written up a project proposal, and a lot of my thinking of that time had been obviously influ influenced by the literature that was available 30 years ago. And to give you a sense of the kind of what the literature was communicating, a gist of it, I'll quote some of what uh, anthropologists had written at that time and also what some ecologists had written. Now, anthropologists had written that in this sort of trans-Himalayan landscape, the balance of livestock, people, and pasture is not degrading or overgrazing the pasture land. There is an abundance and diversity of wildlife. So there was this whole idea and, um, of uh, this people living in harmony with nature, people living in harmony with the uh, wildlife of the region. Ecologists too had um, uh, basically proposed similar ideas. Ecologists had written that wild animals occur in low densities 
and need larger areas to maintain their viable populations, which made a lot of sense. Like I said, the high altitude landscape, uh, the, uh, plant, the growing season is short, the plant productivity is low, and there's only so many herbivores that this landscape can support. And therefore, you know, the number of carnivores are limited to, they have large home ranges, etc. But ecologists had also sort of um, reiterated this, this idea of a harmonious coexistence between people and nature. A generally benign association of wildlife with sparsely distributed population, human population, whose traditional land use and religious practices have permitted long-term coexistence. There was some, and, and so these are, this is the kind of uh, literature that had influenced my thinking as well when I had gone to this area for the first time. But once I started living in this area, you know, trying to observe things around me, making friends, trying to learn how, how things were, and actually also as the research data started coming in, my own sort of these assumptions of harmonious coexistence increasingly came into question. And one incident that I learned of really sort of uh, affected me a lot. One of the things that I learned was that in this village of Kibber, just before the time that I started, I went there and started living there, a snow leopard had entered the village. And this snow leopard had entered the village in search of food. It had managed to enter one of these livestock corrals, livestock pens, and had ended up killing a few livestock. But before it could escape, people had detected its presence. And this snow leopard was trapped in the village and it was killed. And that, it didn't end there. What I also was learned was that um, basically men and women had kept lining up long after the snow leopard had been killed. They lined up to see the carcass, to beat it with sticks, this long dead animal, and curse it for having killed their livestock. At least that's what, how the story went. And this affected me a lot because it made me think, you know, I had these multiple conflicting thoughts about, for example, who was the perpetrator in this case? Was it the snow leopard that had actually ent entered the village and killed multiple livestock? Or was it the people who had killed this beautiful and endangered species so brutally? Similarly, who was the victim? Was it this beautiful animal that had only gone there in search of food because it was hungry? Or was it these people with whom I was beginning to make friends, with whom I was beginning to empathize, um, and who had actually th this, losing every livestock would mean a significant economic setback to them? So uh, once again, who was the victim in this case? Similarly, I had such experiences, you know, as a young and an impressionable researcher. I had a lot of, lots of such experiences, which left me very conflicted. And as research results started coming in, there was like, my ideas of this kind of harmonious coexistence got questioned even more. One of the things that we found was that livestock in these areas were really overstocked. The system was overgrazed. There were many more livestock than could be adequately fed in the rangelands. So not only was this compromising livestock production, but it was also leading to competition or out-competition of the wild herbivores, like the ones you saw in the film, the blue sheep and the ibex, that they were getting out-competed. Now, um, if you look at my entire PhD work done many, many years ago, and the work of our group, even after that, you know, maybe the first six to seven years of work uh, that I was involved in, one could actually summarize it in one simple graph. And you know, at the end of this, if you sort of think why should the society have invested and wasted so much money in supporting me to go and do this research for many years, if all I had to come up with is this simple graph, which I'll explain to you in a moment, you can be forgiven because I often have, the, have very similar thoughts myself. But basically after years of work, what we, what I had found was that as livestock populations in the landscape increased, the population of wild herbivores, the wild prey of snow leopards, the blue sheep and the ibex, they tended to decline. It's quite straightforward and obvious. And as that happened, as livestock populations increased, wild prey populations declined, 
the contribution of livestock to snow leopard diet increased, right? So there are fewer wild herbivores, fewer wild prey to feed on, so they sh sort of shifted their predation pressure on livestock. That was it. That was all I could say after the, or we could say after the first several years of our work, right? And I'll come back to this, keep this in mind. But to summarize, what we had basically found was that Livestock predation by snow leopards intensifies as wild herbivore populations decrease and livestock populations increase. No great finding, no rocket science here. But what it did do was it led us to experiment with one of our initiatives, which is we call as village reserves or village wildlife reserves. So basically what happened was that I Basically, uh, you know, the, my then PhD professor and uh, I, we sort of agreed that we could try and do something about the state of the rangelands and wild herbivores. So I negotiated with the villagers to set aside part of their grazing land for recovery of wild herbivore population and the recovery of the rangelands. And in this case, the wild herbivore was the blue sheep. And this is... Uh, an image of one of the first village reserves that we set up in this landscape in partnership with this village community. Now we'd been monitoring uh, systematically the uh, wild herbivore population and also the livestock population in this landscape and we've been doing that now for 20 years or more. And the response that we saw of blue sheep to this kind of pr uh, protection was actually, I mean it didn't it actually surprised us. It was along expected lines, but the kind of recovery we saw was quite stunning. And the blue sheep population basically increased four to six fold. I mean, this, is the, this was the base sort of uh, population. The arrow shows somewhere around the period when we set up this first village reserve. And over time, it has basically increased. It fluctuates a bit, but it's still at least four times higher than what it used to be. And what one of the things that another thing that happened is and it was kind of unexpected. All this while, I used to we would hardly see signs of snow leopards. The only time you would hear about snow leopards was either, either that incidence when the snow leopard was killed, or occasionally when people would lose a livestock to them. Otherwise, even finding signs of snow leopards would be very difficult. Forget about sightings. But over time, what happened as the wild herbivore population increased in this landscape? The use of this area by snow leopards also started increasing, which we'd not expected. In retrospect, we should have, but at that point in time, I used to always say, oh, this is not really very good habitat for snow leopards. Now today, and I'll tell you a bit more about uh, this later in the talk, but today, this village and this landscape has become the go-to area for snow leopard tourism in winter. I think there's Mr. Ganguly in the audience who is going to go to this area and try to see snow leopards um, this winter. And this is the same village and this is the same landscape where it would be hard to even find a single sign of snow leopard. So this led us to actually think about whether this could be one of the ways to improve the status of snow leopards, conservation status of snow leopards, to work with these village communities to create these kind of village reserves and help in the um, sort of recovery of wild herbivore population. Because as I said earlier, most of the landscape is kind of overgrazed by livestock. So this is again a female blue sheep. So, I mean, these are quite fascinating species in their own right. I don't want you to just think that, you know, uh, these are just prey of the snow leopard. Of course, they are most important prey species of the snow leopard. But these are these incredible group of species. They're called mountain ungulates. Most of them are, they evolved during the ice ages, during the Pleistocene. And um, th these species have basically evolved to live in very cold conditions. So with the advent of the Holocene, when the climate warmed, the glaciers retreated, these mountain ungulates mostly got restricted to mountain tops, which still offer some of the ice age kind of environments. But the other thing they have uh, evolved uh, and adapted for is not just the cold, but also they live in very steep landscapes, really, really steep mountains, where they're able to find food, and they mostly run into cliffs to escape from predators. 
But the problem for them is that snow leopards have also evolved to hunt right inside those cliffs, right? So there's been a sort of an evolutionary arms race of sorts, of sorts between the prey and the predator. And to give you a better sense of this, some of you might have seen this video, but it is worth watching again. Thank you to Wilderness Films for sharing this publicly. So I have watched this video and shown it around hundreds of times, and every time I watch it, I, I feel nervous. And so, I, and I do hope that this does not happen very frequently in nature. At the end of this, I believe the snow leopard survived, but uh, I don't think I can say that for the blue sheep. But uh, so coming back to this idea of um, creating this kind of reserves to sort of improve the conservation status of snow leopards, our subsequent research, actually conducted by uh, one of my former PhD students, Dr. Kulbushan Singh Suryavanshi, the person you saw in the film briefly, what his uh, research showed was that indeed the density of wild prey, such as the blue sheep and the ibex and, and other species like the argali, is one of the most critical determinants of abundance of snow leopards in any landscape. So snow leopard abundance depends on the abundance of their wild prey and not the abundance of livestock. So that sort of gives one the hope that you know, if you could establish reserves, village, work with the village communities directly and establish reserves like this in addition to protected areas, that the status of snow leopards would improve. But then there is another issue related to snow leopards and which is that they are what we call landscape species. They have pretty large home range requirements. So um, way back, we used to think that a typical home range size of a snow leopard is something like about something between 20 to 30 uh, square kilometers, uh, which was based on a few snow leopards that researchers those days in the 90s had managed to radio color and uh, late 80s and early 90s. And it was mostly based on handheld ground-based uh, what is called VHF tracking. But those technologies were limiting in terms of what the researcher, admirable though that work was, but you know, the, uh, the, even the areas, the kind of landscapes that these animals use, it's very hard for a researcher to sort of cover the whole landscape and you know, track snow leopards. But over time, technology improved. And since 2008, our team's been sort of doing the most comprehensive and long-term ecological study of snow leopards that's ever been undertaken. It's an ongoing study that started in 2008, 2009. We have been able to radio collar more than 30 individual snow leopards across generations. Our team's right now actually in the field still collaring snow leopards. And these collars were more the more advanced technology, satellite-based GPS collars. And what, what we found was that actually the home range needs of snow leopards were six to 44 times higher. And so a single snow leopard, you know, ranging between, so males ranging more than 207 square kilometers, females ranging 125 square kilometers. So that creates challenges because, you know, which, what this means is that we could be working with in one protected area or with one village uh, community, but the, snow, the same snow leopard in its normal course of movement could just go and get killed somewhere. I mean, you could be doing a lot of conservation work here in this part of town but then the same snow leopard tomorrow might be in Devanhalli or somewhere and goes and gets killed there. So this is, a, this, is a, uh, this is a challenge. And protected areas are simply inadequate. So most, there's about 170 protected areas in the global range of snow leopards across these 12 countries in Asia. 
Our research is showing that 90% of those areas, those uh, protected areas, are not even large enough to have 15 adult females, right? And 60% of those protected areas are not large enough to have even one adult male. So just relying on protected areas are important, but just relying on protected areas is simply not enough. So you really have to sort of expand the scope of conservation, expand the horizon beyond protected area boundaries, and really sort of think about conservation in larger landscapes, which is, of course, easier said than done. But what our um, team is particularly in at the Nature Conservation Foundation and in India, what we have done over time, one of the things that we did was to partner closely with the government, in this case with the government of Himachal Pradesh, to actually try help create a landscape level plan, a management plan for snow leopards and conservation in the entire Spiti landscape. And what you see in red is what we proposed as setting up of village, the community reserves, in partnership with village communities. To just give you a sense, the, one of the sort of first village reserves that we set up is this one. But over the years, uh, in the last, particularly in the last seven, eight years, most of this landscape today, most of the red area is actually protected through these kind of village reserves uh, in partnership with village communities. But the villages are many, many more. And so our attempt is always to actually work with all those villages and most of those villages so that, and the communities, so that the, you know, uh, the, um, so, so we don't have that problem that snow leopards could just move around and get, be protected in one area, one village, and get killed in another one. Well, it's a complicated uh, effort. It's a complicated job. I mean, if you look at protected area management, some of you might be familiar, that itself is a very, very difficult and complicated business. And just to pr provide you with a very simplified representation, the kind of stakeholders you would want to work in a protected area, which has no other land uses. The wildlife conservation is the mandate, but in such areas, you would still need to work closely with the wildlife management, with law enforcement, if, if the protected areas have to be really effective, that has to be coordination with the police, with the judiciary, et cetera. The central government as well as state governments, which is where the laws are made, which is where the funding comes from, the tourism departments, and at least from my perspective and the perspective of the way we work, local communities who must remain ex very, very important partners in protected area management as well. Now think about trying to work with stakeholders in, at a landscape level, which is beyond protected areas. Of course, these, these uh, stakeholders remain important. Local communities perhaps become even more important. But then there are other stakeholders that be start becoming important that one would need to engage with. There are the various agricultural related departments, animal husbandry, border development, fisheries. What I'm, trying to sh what I'm showing you here is actually a simplified, uh, a much simplified representation of a real stakeholder analysis from Spiti Valley. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stakeholders that get involved, and it's really, really hard to actually be working with all these people. And uh, so how do you do that? How does one do that? I mean, the only way to do that is through partnerships, and which is what we try to do. I mean, which is one of the reasons for me to come here and give a talk, is to sort of drive home the message that you know, conservation is not the job of people, the sole job of people like me or the forest department or the government. I think in wildlife and nature conservation, we all can play a role. And I'll sort of emphasize that point a little bit more. We all should be playing a much bigger role than we do. So one of the things that we did, um, and this is an effort we started sometime in 2005 or so, is to start working with the government of India to try to create a special sort of a conservation strategy and plan for the high mountain areas, for snow leopard landscapes in our five Himalayan states. And so our team, particularly my colleague, Dr. Yashvir Bhatnagar, he and I, we went to each of the states. We spent a long time with the central government. And after about four years of effort, we were able to, the government actually launched something which is called Project Snow Leopard, 
which is the sort of conservation strategy and action plan for uh, snow leopards and high mountains across India. And one of the important things that we sort of made sure was that this plan recognized and provided for was a strong grassroots local community involvement in conservation through better livelihood opportunities for local people as well as better programs at uh, conflict management. Then in 2012-13, there came an opportunity for us to help establish a, sort of a high-level intergovernmental alliance of all 12 snow leopard range countries. Right? And so our main idea was to really try to create more awareness and bring the issues of snow leopard and high mountain conservation into the sort of political consciousness at the highest levels. And what we were able to do, not just on our own, but with a multiple uh, range of partners, is to create this intergovernmental alliance. It's called the Global Snow Leopard and Ecosystem Protection Program. We've continued to play a really important role in this program, but there have been other several partners involved in this, including many of these multilateral organizations, including the United Nations. Now, this program is basically as part of this program, all 12 range country governments, which includes you know, other, other countries, Central Asian countries, also um, China, uh, uh, Russia, et cetera, all these 12 countries, they have together agreed that in the first phase of this program, they would basically undertake steps to address a few important issues such as poaching and illegal wildlife trade, but in addition, sort of these 20 large landscapes, these are not protected areas per se, they include, some parts of them include protected areas, but the governments are committed to increasing the protection and conservation status in these large landscapes, and at least on paper there is commitment to promote more sort of sustainable and green development of local e economies within this landscape. And when this program was launched in 2013, it was launched by the uh, president of the Kyrgyz Republic and we, with participation of um, political leaders of all 12 uh, range country governments. It was done through what is called the, the Bishkek Declaration of 2013. And for me and for us, what has been really important once again is the recognition in the Bishkek development that the way to achieve snow leopard conservation was important way to do so was by securing the involvement livelihood and balanced economic development of human communities who live there. So this program's been ongoing. There's still much more to be done, results to be seen on the ground. But one of the things that this program has actually managed to do is to bring this whole concerns of high mountain conservation and snow leopard conservation, bring it a lot of visibility. I am pleased to greet the Snow Leopards at Ecosystem Protection International Forum. And I thank the government of Kyrgyzstan. For this is Antonio uh, Guterres, no the Secretary General of the United music, Nations. But the message they can Even five years ago, it would have been hard for me to imagine for the that the Secretary General of the United Nations would speak on behalf of snow leopards. So that has the been really sort of inspiring and encouraging for us. Wild across 12 countries in Central, East, and South Asia. Shrinking habitats, poaching, and climate change all threaten their existence. Investing in the snow leopard's fragile mountain habitats is essential for people and planet, for biodiversity, conservation, and sustainable development. Comprehensive transboundary strategies are needed to restore snow leopard populations, and we must work together to end illegal wildlife trade, to stop habitat fragmentation, and to prevent human-wildlife conflicts. So from this sort of high level uh, in a sort of global level, let me, let us just go back to the village of Kibber, where I started my research and some of the conservation journey. What happened here? Just a quick recap. The wild herbivore population increased over time once we were able to set up this community-managed uh, village reserve. Snow leopard use of the area increased to the extent, like I said earlier, that this has become a go-to destination for snow leopard tourism. And uh, so, and it's become a significant source of income for the local people as well. 
many of our learnings from this experience with the village community of Kibber, but also with other communities that we have partnered with and we continue to have long-term partnerships with help to influence and help us to help develop these national and even international policies and strategies. The experience has given us, helped us to create training programs in community-based conservation for conservation practitioners. Those programs are being sort of, uh, uh, people are being trained in multiple countries in how to better engage uh, local communities in conservation efforts. And remember that all this is sort of uh, based on the research that was done, the science that was done, and that one um, graph that I showed you several years of my work. But there's something that uh, happened sort of 13 years after the first time I had been to Kibber. Dr. Kulbhushan Singh Suryavanshi, once again, he went to Kibber to start his research. And that's when things start getting in interesting and a bit more uncomfortable for me. So science can be very humbling. So what Kulu's work, when, when he started his research and his uh, results started coming, his work ended up questioning pretty much every assumption that had founded the basis of my work, of my research. And his uh, research actually questioned some of the basic findings of my work. So if you thought that you and the society had wasted time sending me up there and at the end of six years coming up with that simple graph, even that graph turned out to be incorrect. Okay? And what his work actually showed was that, okay, my, my finding, I'm repeating this here, livestock predation by snow leopards intensifies as wild herbivore populations decrease and livestock populations increase. Not just my finding, but our group in our first few years of research. Now what Kulu's research then shows is that livestock predation by snow leopards intensifies as wild herbivore populations decrease or if they increase. And it really depends on where you are, where the system is in that sort of trajectory or in that plane. So, so what this means is that there can be more predation on livestock by snow leopards when the population of blue sheep increases or it decreases, either way is possible. So where did I get things wrong? Now, a lot of uh, the earlier research, and even today, the way one studies, many of you might know, one studies the diet of many species, including these predators, is to look at their feces, their poop. You collect their feces, you bring them back, analyze in the lab, look for prey remains in the feces, and then you try to reconstruct the diet of what the predator might, must have eaten. Now, in the last 10 or 15 years, most of you probably know that camera trapping as a technology became really improved and it's become a huge, fantastic tool for field researchers trying to study or monitor populations, especially of um, you know, these kind of rare and elusive species. So I'm going to show you a stitched together sequence of images from one of our camera traps. This is from way back in 2009. Look at this. So here's a snow leopard in front of our, one of our cameras. It defecates. It hasn't realized that the camera is watching. So for a researcher like me or Kulu or anyone else, this becomes like a data point, right? Later on, you go and you find a scat like this and you collect it. But see what happens five days later. A fox decides to come and investigate and he defecates right on the snow leopard scat, right? So these are the kind of scats, for example, that we were going and collecting, believing very confidently, believing in our natural history skills and abilities that this was, of course, snow leopard uh, scat, right? Now, over time, genetics techniques became more accessible. Genetic screening became cheaper and more accessible to researchers like us. And when you actually look at the scats that we were collecting, labeling them very confidently as snow leopard scats, when we actually, you know, we did a round of screening of those cats, some, uh, what you find is that we were getting it right just about 40% of the time. 
60% of the time we were actually, the scats were contaminated or they simply belonged to other spe species and not to snow leopards, right? So these are the, I mean, this is not the only mistake we've made and this is not the, we constantly, you know, even with camera trapping, the kind of data, even in the last 10 years, the kind of data and information that we have is amazing, but when you actually end up, and we've been doing that, trying to test some of the fundamental assumptions of camera trap based research, you find that we're still making big mistakes. So that's how, I mean, but that, that's, that's the way it is. I mean, you know, that's the way it goes with science. You, you try your best, use the available technologies and resources at that point in time, arrive at certain conclusions, think that's what the reality is. But, you know, over time, those ideas get, tend to get challenged, sometimes change. Sometimes you're proved completely wrong. At other times, if you're lucky, um, you know, it's... Uh, uh, basically, um, you know, you sort of the ideas evolve if they are not rejected completely. And so, the only saving grace for me in all this was Kulu was my own PhD student. Eh? Otherwise, it would be even more embarrassing. Anyway, but this is a bit more complicated than just getting the science wrong, right? Because we are making decisions about conservation also based on this kind of research. So one of the arguments, not, not the main argument, but one of the arguments that I had used and we, uh, while sort of negotiating this first village reserve with the community was that if the blue sheep population increases, it's going to deflect predation from livestock onto these wild herbivores, right? And so, and, but look, let's look at what actually happened. One of the things that, that happened as the blue sheep population on this plateau increased, people started facing much more crop problems with crop damage. Now, like I said in the beginning, they are able to produce only one crop a year. And not just that, during these last 20, 30 years, actually the foundation of their economy has shifted from livestock to crops. They're raising cash crops now. And so that's a really important source of livelihood. But here, as a result of a successful conservation effort, the they, are, they started facing more crop damage. And this has become a common theme across many villages in Spiti and Ladakh. So of course we have to sort of devise something. So we have a new program where uh, you know, we support uh, two sort of youth, two guards from every village during the crop growing season, whose main job is to stay vigilant and keep an eye on the blue sheep and uh, wild herbivore population herds. And if any are coming close to the crop fields, they, they are, and their job is to sort of uh, scare them away. And of course, like Kulu's work showed, we don't know for sure, but if Kulu's work is actually, we can believe that, at least for now, then the predation levels on livestock would also have gone up as a result of successful conservation, simply because earlier, if snow leopards were killing more livestock because there was not enough wild prey, now they were simply perhaps more snow leopards using this landscape, and therefore the net predation on livestock may still have increased rather than uh, decline. Now, one of the things, thankfully, that we had done in the early years, we had piloted, was this livestock insurance program. Although the film was shot in, um, in Ladakh, the first community to partner with this and experiment with this was the community of Kibber. And uh, so, this woman had lost one of her cattle to wild predators, and here she's getting compensated for the insured livestock. So this is the, but the, this is the challenge with conservation. You know, it's like a, there's no, there's no solution. It's like a wicked problem. There's one thing or the other that must, that keeps happening, and that you need to keep adapting to, as well as trying to address in whatever uh, way is possible. Now. Poaching of snow leopards, again, sort of expanding our horizon a bit, poaching and illegal wildlife, um, illegal wildlife trade in snow leopards has always been an issue. Um, there's demand, there's retaliatory killing, of course, by communities like this. Often that tends to form linkages with the actual more organized illegal wildlife trade. And it turns out that in the last, it's always been a problem, but particularly more so this problem seems, seems to be intensifying and across the range of the snow leopards. And why this is happening, it is hard to say. It is in perhaps increased access. Some of these landscapes that used to be remote are no longer as remote as they used to be. They are better connected. 
snow leopards live in high mountains they, that also form political boundaries. We are not the best of uh, neighbors with each other. We in fight, there's been armed conflicts in these areas. Countries like Afghanistan have had a huge amount of poverty and political um, instability as well. And one of the consequences on the first victims when there is poverty and political instability together is the wildlife because people need protein, people need some source of cash income, and therefore, you know, wildlife trade tends to flourish in these kind of landscapes. But it's not just poverty, affluence too. What we are finding, what our team, you know, in China is finding is that the instances of illegal wildlife trade in snow leopards are increasing, or have been increasing, especially in the last eight, 10, 12 years. And much more now, you find much more such cases being recorded. Earlier, most of the instances used to be in the provinces like Tibet or Xinjiang or Qinghai, where you actually have snow leopards. But over time, you record more and more cases of illegal wildlife trade in the wealthy coastal cities of China, just because people's purchasing power has increased. So that, like I said, there's a constant, it's a constantly changing landscape of conservation. So of course, we, we had to, we, we decided that it was becoming such a huge problem, maybe it's even linked to perhaps better protection of tigers, that uh, the demand for snow leopard bones and pelts has increased, I, we don't know. But one of the things that we decided to do was to sort of try to assist governments and enforcement agencies better in their efforts to disrupt illegal wildlife trade. In the last two years, we have sort of created a, a comprehensive database, a constantly updated database of all cases related to snow leopard, all detected cases related to snow leopards, illegal uh, poaching and poaching and illegal wildlife trade of snow leopards since the 1990s or late 80s for, from when data are available. So we've been managed to consolidate databases of several other organizations and we have people who are constantly um, uh, mining the internet to try and record any such new cases. It's a relatively new initiative. Actually, the database is housed. This project's being run out of the Nature Conservation Foundation office in Bangalore. The way it works is, or the, the vision for this is that we have all 12 range country governments sign off on this, so it is being supported as part of the global program. And the idea is to be able to share whenever there is an instance of poaching or illegal wildlife trade that comes anywhere in the public sphere, to bring it to the attention of the concerned uh, government and enforcement agency. And also constantly over time, trying to constantly analyze data as these database develops to try and identify if there are any new hotspots emerging, any new trade routes that are, might be emerging um, over time, and then again bring that to the attention of um, governments, the relevant governments and enforcement agencies. There are other issues, of course. I will not talk much about climate change, but like I said earlier, these landscapes used to be considered very remote. I mean, relatively speaking, they still are. Even Spiti Valley is relatively remote today. Nevertheless, you know, access has dramatically changed over the last 10 years, especially. Much more sort of new roads, infrastructural development. What used to be once remote areas have opened up. In two of the countries that we work in, especially, and we've been fighting actually battles to a reasonable amount of success against mining uh, sort of spreading into some of the most important snow leopard landscapes. So, but it's, it's, a, it's a, once again a constantly sort of changing socioeconomic, political, and threats landscape for snow leopards and high mountain ecosystems. So those days when I started my work and the, okay, um, I think the baby does not like goats, but uh, those days when I started this work, um, uh, I used to think of livestock itself as being a big problem for snow leopard conservation. Today my view has changed completely. I think livestock are a good problem to have. Having some local stake in the landscape is a good thing. And one of the important sort of um, products, one of the important sources of livelihood for local communities in snow leopard landscapes in many parts of South and Central Asia is pashmina, Kashmir, that we all use. It is a, most of us use it, but it, is, but it is a largely Western fuel demand for pashmina. And to just give a 
sense of the trade, the total sort of global production that is at least in trade is about 20,000 metric tons. India is a relatively small contributor, but Ladakh is one of our most important uh, Pashmina producing areas. You need a significantly large population of goats. It's, Pashmina is, by the way, for those of you who don't know, it's the underwool of these goats that are raised at really high altitude, cold environments. As a result of this kind of um, demand for Pashmina, Locally, livestock populations have increased in many parts of the range. And Ladakh, for instance, uh, the goat populations have increased over time. Ladakh, like I said, is an important snow leopard, um, uh, important Pashmina producing, the most important Pashmina producing area of India. And that has consequences. Now, this is a species called the Tibetan gazelle. It's a Tibetan plateau species. But within India also, it used to have in eastern Ladakh uh, until the 1950s, its range was something of the order of 20,000 square kilometers. By, you know, the a war was fought in that area um, uh, in the 60s, and then sort of by the 90s, so this was the sort of original range of the Tibetan gazelle in eastern Ladakh. By the 1990s, the range had shrunk dramatically as a result of poaching, as a result of hunting, as well as excessive livestock raising. Hunting came under control by the late 80s, but intensive life, uh, livestock grazing pressures actually intensified. And uh, you know, this is sort of, we have less than 100 animals precariously surviving on the, in the pastures of um, Changtang, Eastern Changtang in Ladakh. So like I said, you know, this, this, this constantly changing dynamic and things like that, so what do you do about this? And the kind of sort of economic development model that we have as a society chosen to follow since the industrial revolution, these economies of scale and things like that, there is no doubt that you know, there are some areas which are under the protected area network. Hopefully we'll be able to hold on to them, although they are under tremendous pressures as well. But most of the biodiversity in the other landscapes is going to go and is going to go fast. And so one of the things that we are trying to do increasingly is uh, in the last couple of years, with, um, and it's an idea that it's still at an idea stage that we are exploring, is to ask ourselves if, at least for these kind of landscapes, at least in high mountains, if not for areas on the planet where there's still some biodiversity that still remains, at least for these high mountains, can we sort of, can ecosystem conservation and cultural preservation become the basis for economic development? rather than always being the victim of economic development. And so sort of try and get ahead of the curve a little bit and try and see if sort of economic development could be sort of green, relatively more sustainable economic development could be promoted rather than always you know, trying to uh, firefight. So even as economic development is happening, are there opportunities to sort of nudge the trajectory in a way that is less damaging to the environment and more inclusive in terms of its dependence on the local ecosystems as well as inclusive in the terms of the livelihood it, livelihoods it generates for local communities. I mean, Perhaps it's a utopian idea, but we definitely think it is worth trying. So it's this idea that we are, for want of a better term, currently call, calling conservation for development. So it's, a, it's not so much a conservation model, but trying to create a model for economic development. And for this, we've actually been uh, working with a couple of uh, governments. One is the government of Kyrgyzstan where we've sort of uh, made some progress and there is the possibility that the government of Kyrgyzstan might actually be in a position to pass an act of parliament which would basically create this legal framework for what we are calling ecologically, um, uh, what do you call them, economic uh, zones? Where? Uh, yeah, special economic zones. Along similar lines, we call, we're sort of trying to promote this idea of a special ecological zone. So the idea being that the governments agree, just like they do in the case of special economic zones, that they agree to provide the financial incentives to both investors and entrepreneurs and make it attractive to actually uh, for... Um, for investments in relatively green economic development projects. Uh, 
which are spatially very explicit, clearly defined, where there is a space for conservation. Hopefully, I mean, like I said, it could be a bit open idea, but we never know until we try. Be able to promote enterprises that are also sort of more inclusive, that are dependent on local economies and cultures, and that generate more livelihoods for people. We are hoping that we'll be able to get global investors interested in something like this, and um, potentially bring in both the resources as well as the technology, and have local entrepreneurs be provided with the opportunity to set up these relatively conservation-friendly enterprises. Thank you. Uh, that's one of the most comprehensive presentations I've ever sat through. Great one. Uh, two quick questions. One, uh, uh, do you have some stats on the insurance claims from the 11 places where you have the program? Um, second one, what might be the land classification for the village reserves that is setting up and maybe the size of it? Yeah, sure. How, because I understand that maybe the villages have to give up some of their available resources for conservation. How do you negotiate that? Thanks. Absolutely. Great questions, both of them. The stats I um, do not have except that what I can tell you is from the uh, top of my head, I can tell you that typically there's about 60% of the uh, households that tend to become involved in it. Even if more get involved, somehow it tends to stabilize around 60%. So it does not have 100% coverage. Um, it's a complicated program, you know, we have other efforts which I haven't spoken about which are much more simple for people to adopt, but this is more complicated, it requires much more of social capital trust amongst people themselves because it's, you know, people have to invest their money and it has to be managed transparently, etc. So it's a complicated program and so, but yet, the first village that we um, started this program, which is Kibar, is still running it, this is the... 17th year running in Ladakh, 13, 14 years and things like that. Seems like it seems to help, it seems to work for communities. We have some sort of write-ups on the stats and I'm happy to share that. We uh, can provide visual with some of the uh, information. So, but it's, it's a difficult one to implement. It's not easy, it takes a long time, it requires a long-term relationship and partnership before something like this becomes acceptable. Yeah, to people. Like Kulu said importantly in that film, you know, it's not just that it has to be applicable and useful, it has to be acceptable to people and this tends to take time. Uh, as far as the village reserves are concerned, I think there are two parts to a question. One is about the typical size. It's been very variable. Now for some of the largest reserves are of the order of 240 square kilometers. Pretty big. And whereas the smallest ones are perhaps one square kilometer, which was done specifically for the Tibetan girl, Tibetan the small population that is still surviving precariously on the Tibetan desert. Now, the, we've had very interesting experience uh, in relation to the kind of negotiations that you talked about. Firstly, that um, yes, you know, if people have to give up part of their grazing land, you know, that is a cost to them. So in the first few villages when we set this up, and, and let me also be, um, uh, be, uh, be upfront in telling you that not everywhere have we seen the kind of dramatic response that, that I showed. You know, the response is variable, and we don't know why, and based on the local condition, and perhaps some of them still need more time. But the, uh, coming back to the, um, in a lot of these areas, the way we negotiated was in the first few we used they used to rent out, they had a history of renting out their grazing land to migratory herders. And over time they had stopped doing that because they um, felt that that was damaging the pastures. So we sort of could use those, those you know, there was a standard sort of an independent objective measure of being able to compensate for the lost grazing. But the, uh, so we were providing that from conservation funds, but the important thing there was that the money was not going to individuals, but I'm very clumsy, I'm very sorry, I'm always like this. So the money is not going to the uh, individuals, but to the community, used for, and they have come all complete rights over how they use the money. Sometimes they used it for village development, sometimes just to repair their local monastery or whatever it may be. Over time the model changed uh, and uh, not everywhere. Some places it's the same thing, in other places it's like they have requested for 
assistance with a few things. You know, they've had, the herders have a lot of difficulty, so they have had requests for tents that they can use and solar lighting and things like that. But really, it's sort of it's not a transactional thing. It's based on a long-term relationship, and it's not just the only thing we try to do with the community. Not the only thing is so. It's it's part of this sort of more broad-based relationship. And uh, the last last uh, point that you I think implicitly made was there is some lost grazing. What happens to the livestock? I think fortunately for us, the other thing that has happened is most of this landscape, not in eastern Ladakh though, is that agriculture, crop production sort of became more important. They still maintain livestock and still keep livestock, but perhaps it's not as big a loss to them as it would have been, let's say, about 20 years ago. Uh, so it's again variable. There are places. I mean, the, again, the land tenure is not always very clear in these landscapes. Sometimes, you know, the forest department would claim that some of these lands are inside a wildlife sanctuary protected area. Some of it is land where communities have. Most of it is land where communities do have at least use of cut rights. Okay. Um, we have uh, Thomas. Uh, okay, we have a question at the back. Hi. Um, lovely presentation, but we saw only the last half of it. Uh, the graph that you showed with the, uh, the Venn diagram about wildlife and uh, conservation becoming uh, an integral part of you know, sorry, uh, about uh, you know when you increase Kashmir production, the Pashmina, I would want to understand how that's possible. You think Pashmina production would help in uh, conservation? So Pashmina production is already happening in this area and the current mandate of both the government and the you know, sheep husbandry department and things like that is to increase our level of production and that's really not we believe sustainable. If at all you know over the short term they can still do it. The problem is that there have been a lot of attempts to actually improve the yield from every goat. But every goat on the average produces very little Pashmina, it's about you know a few hundred grams at most. So we believe that you know just going on increasing livestock production, increasing livestock population is not the solution. But then it is an important part of local high livelihoods and culture. I would take Pashmina production any day over let's say mining the area for uranium or whatever, or coal or whatever it might be. So what we are trying to actually do is to through this program, and we've actually um, in these five villages we've been working in the last three or four years to really help the farmers to adopt some of these relatively more conservation friendly measures, revive some of the rotational practices, have uh, you know predator proofing, we help them with all that, predator proofing of corals so that the predators don't get killed as they used to etc etc. So, so the idea is to sort of try and um, create this slightly different kind of economy than the trajectory that it is currently following. So it's a, it's a reality in this landscape, it's not like once trying to introduce Pashmina production, it's been part of the landscape for a long time. The idea is to try and make it a bit more sustainable. And through these practices and hopefully hopefully through entrepreneurs who are able to use this whole label of sustainably produced Pashmina and hopefully through consumers who are conscious enough to try and buy such products. Yes, please. Yeah, question there. Yeah. the mic. Oh, sorry, we'll come to you in a moment. So, um, I, I just had one. I mean, like, uh, in the whole domain of the 12 countries, uh, Mongolia forms a very large portion of it from whatever I've read. And how would you uh, compare the conservation efforts in Mongolia compared to that that we're doing in India for that matter? Yeah, it's a good question. Slightly sensitive one, too. I know I'm being recorded here. But uh, firstly, yes, Mongolia is an important country. The most important fringe country is China. China has 60% of the uh, snow leopard habitat. Next comes Mongolia, but Mongolia is a, it's a second by a long way. Now, the, but it is a, the second most important fringe country. Now, I think it's variable in terms of the efforts that are being undertaken in Mongolia versus efforts being undertaken in India. I think in terms of some kind of research and conservation efforts and community-based conservation efforts that have been undertaken. I think there are things that Mongolia has learned from us. At the same time, there is stuff that we have learned from Mongolia. And there's been a, one of our programs in India, it's called Shen, 
which is a handicrafts program for involving local women because one of the our research was showing that really women tend to have a much more negative uh, attitude towards conservation and snow leopards compared to men and we also realized we are not actually reaching out to the women adequately in the communities so that's a program that is actually um, targeted specifically at women it's not that men are not allowed but it's you know women tend to participate in those programs more and that's a program is the the model actually has come from our work in Mongolia which we have uh, uh, now using in Spiti uh, but uh, yeah I guess it's variable both countries have their own sets of problems in Mongolia is one of those countries where mining is a huge issue it's become a really important part of Mongolian economy especially since early 2000s so they rationalized their mining laws and things like that very very rich, rich in sort of subsoil resources, that entire country or that part of the world. So, so yeah, so actually I mentioned that two of these countries that we were able, fighting battles to save uh, lands uh, from mining, and Mongolia is one of those countries where, yes, our team there and led by this incredible woman, her name is Bayra, she was able to over time, over, it took us about eight years, seven, six to seven years of work and finally, there's a large protected area created in Mongolia, um, in this area which was like completely covered by mining licenses at one point in time, exploratory mostly. Now the government declared a 7,500 square kilometer protected area, huge protected area, the first protected area in Mongolia dedicated to protecting snow leopards in the Gobi. And, um, and yeah, but the, the nice thing is that it's a protected, it has the highest conservation status under Mongolian law, but it allows for co-management with local communities, so we are co-managing it with local communities and the local government, and it allows for the traditional practices of livestock raising, raising and others. So I guess it's like, a, it's a mixed bag. Where's the mic? Ah. Thank you for the presentation, sir. My question is to do with the Pashmina production. So with the increase in Pashmina production, there will be a need for an increase in livestock, which in turn will lead to an increase in their grazing lands. So wouldn't this be risking the land set aside for uh, wild herbivores? Yeah, absolutely. That's an um, important concern. So the, uh, like I said, what we are trying to do is to not, I think the default mode is to increase Pashmina production which means to increase livestock. What we are trying to do is to try and set up setting practices to what extent we will be successful over the long term remains to be seen. But what we are trying to do is rather than increasing livestock population, uh, trying to sort of steer the system, production system and economy in a direction where the value of the Pashmina that they are production, producing that can be bound up rather than the production itself. But, you know, I mean, um, We'll see where we get. Thank you. Hi, uh, we missed uh, a lot of your presentation. Sorry for myself and uh, mother, we are seven years old. Um, I have a slightly uh, different uh, question on a slightly more multi dimensional theme. There is, of course, talk of conservation and even within conservation, the dynamics of, say, a project tiger would be vastly different from what you're doing. But there are, especially in the Himalayan uh, regions, uh, there are extremely well-managed, evolved organizations like the Ikimol and others who do a lot of livelihood, social development. What is kind of, I mean, in this modern narratives of conservation, what's the kind of interactions between the two? That along with you mentioned offsets, that's a particular for people like us who work in those kind of areas. I think it's. I mean, the sooner we get uh, uh, all of these integrated, yes. are there any platforms that integrate? Say, for example, where societal development happens or economic development happens, and where yeah. leading conservations are like you. And if you allow a question, uh, the arts seven year olds allow the question. Especially seven year olds. Yes. Are snow lumpers found in Mansarovar? Okay. That's a great question and I will of course give him priority. What's your name? My name is Madhav. Madhav, thanks, uh, thanks for coming here. Thank you for asking the question. So, you know, 
the Mansarovar lake is on the Tibetan plateau, as you know, and then the surrounding mountains, you know, the Tibetan plateau has a lot of these mountains, right? And so the surrounding mountains have snow leopards. What snow leopards don't use is relatively, if there are large expanses of flat areas, they may cross them, but they don't use them, they don't live there, but they, they tend to live in the mountains around Mansarovar, for example. Thank you. Yeah, and coming back to your question, sir, I think that uh, you mentioned you see more. Um, yes, there are organizations like this who have been trying to do this kind of work with similar sort of, I guess, philosophies. ECMOT has been invited uh, and they have participated in some of these uh, uh, events that we've had related to the Global Snow Leopard Ecosystem Protection Program. Now, the thing is that the whole um, it is in some sense a response to this need that you articulated that we actually decided to really push for this intergovernmental alliance. So it's an inter it's an alliance where we we could where we thought we could actually undertake programs such that individual conservationists, individual organizations, or even organizations like ECMOD would find hard to or us would find hard to implement. For example poaching and illegal wildlife trade being one of them, which, you know, there's a lot of cross-border elements, there's huge, you know, issues, largely issues of enforcement, and of course some community engagement is necessary and we are starting those efforts. But those kind of things, you need a government platform, government supported platform to be able to do that. Similarly, this whole need to push forward a relatively more green, whatever that might mean, a more sustainable economy. Individual organizations cannot do that. All we might be able to do at best is to work with the community here, with the landscape here, try to create models that could be built upon, learned from and built upon, but really it is that kind of a platform and this is the kind of platform that was created just for this purpose. How again, once again, you know, how, how successful it's going to be and things like that remains to be seen. But uh, the, the green, green economy and this agenda to push relatively more sustainable economic development in small leopard landscapes of high Asia is definitely one of the priority mandates, especially as this program enters its second phase. Okay, there's just last question. So whoever has the mic. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. I'm so sorry. Maybe I can take it. After the uh, so yes, as Mr. Suryanchi's research, research showed that even when herbivore populations are increasing, even that could lead to more attacks on livestock. Yes. So how, uh, any theories on how that could happen? Because logically thinking, I, I can't think of why. Or yeah, I, actually, I mean, in retrospect, it's all very simple. It's a bit like my graph. You can also, in retrospect, you can also start questioning why the society invested, decided to invest so much in Kundu's research. But basically it is this, that, you know, either when there is fewer prey, wild prey of snow leopards, I mean, the fact is clearly wild prey are preferred over livestock, okay? But when there is fewer wild prey, some more livestock tend to get killed. But when there is more wild prey, remember that the abundance of snow leopard itself is increasing because wild prey abundance is the most critical determinant of the abundance of snow leopards and their use of areas. So in fact, not just abundance, what we are, our radio quality works also showing that there are these hot spots areas which seem like they are rich in wild prey species, uh, populations, there's many home ranges that tend to overlap, many snow leopard home ranges that tend, tend to overlap in such areas. So then when there is an increase in snow leopard abundance in the landscape, the net result could still be more livestock getting killed, even though sort of, you know, individually, an individual snow leopard might be preferring livestock. So actually, ultimately, it turns out to be very simple. And it is, that's what our current understanding is. Maybe we can talk again in five years time. Um, but uh, Viju had said it was going to be a hard um, deadline, so I have to respect that. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Thank you for all the great questions.